Welcome into Mock Trial Masterclass, your guide to controlling the courtroom. I'm Luke, and I want you to be a Mock Trial Master. Let's talk about how you can make that happen. A question that I get a lot is, Luke, how do I decide which witnesses my team should call? On both the high school and college levels, it's typical for you to go into a mock trial competition having to pick from a list of witnesses that is more lengthy uh, than you're actually able to call. A lot of times in college, for example, you can have nine, ten different witnesses in a case and you have to narrow it down to decide which ones you want to call because you only get three. So what we're gonna go over in this video is a framework that's gonna help you make the best decision for which witnesses your team calls. Before we go into that framework though, I want you to know that it's probably not always going to be possible for every witness that you call to hit all three of these prongs we're about to introduce every single time. So what you're gonna want is to look at the available witnesses Go ahead and check off the ones that do hit all three of these prongs. And then with whatever's left over, ask yourself, okay, which of these witnesses gives me the best chance of hitting one of these prongs? Or which one gets the closest to hitting these? Because again, you may not hit all three with every single one. And you're going to understand why in just one second. So are you ready to go over which witnesses you need to pick? Let's take a look at the list of the three things you got to keep in mind. Number one, and this is most important, you want to pick witnesses that have a high scoring potential. Look, at the end of the day, mock trial is nothing more than a dog and pony show where you're being judged by scoring judges who are scoring, big shock, right? Who are scoring your individual performances from one to 10. I always tell my team that at the end of this trial, no one's actually going to jail or no one's actually going to have to pay up on a lawsuit. It's all about your performances and it's all about your score. And that's why scoring potential is the first thing you need to look at when you're considering which witnesses to call. So, for example, witnesses that tend to have a high scoring potential are what I would call the main character witnesses. These are gonna be your party witnesses like the plaintiff, uh, the defendant, the victim in a criminal trial. Uh, this is gonna be your experts. A lot of times experts tend to score really well because they have a lot to talk about. It's easy to impress scores as an expert as you're taking difficult concepts and breaking them down into easy to understand language. And even some character witnesses have very high scoring potential if you develop the character in the right way and present them in an engaging way manner. So this has got to be number one as you're looking for which witnesses to call. Pick witnesses with a high scoring potential. Number two, you want to pick witnesses that are going to have a strong impact on your case. Now this seems obvious, but I've run into countless teams judging competitions and coaching my team at competitions and watching other teams compete. Uh, teams that will call witnesses where they finish their direct examination and you're sort of sitting there asking yourself, what was the purpose of this witness? Like, why did they even call this person to the stand? Now, I realize, because I've been doing this for a while, that sometimes the witnesses that you have to choose between don't always have a whole lot of substance to offer, especially when you're talking about uh, character witnesses or eyewitnesses. You know, these witnesses who they're not a main character, as I mentioned a minute ago, they're not an expert, and so there's maybe not a whole lot they have to offer. Well, you can't just call a witness and have them come up and make jokes and be funny and then offer absolutely nothing to your case, right? That's not going to accomplish anything. So that's part of the high scoring potential, right? It's okay to be funny. It's okay to develop a unique, quirky character, but they've got to add something to your case. Now, there's a reason that I put this at number two, because we want to consider that high scoring potential before we think about adding to the case. But if we're deciding between witnesses and, and we need like a tiebreaker beyond the performance metric, we've got to look at how a witness is going to impact our case. 
And again, not every witness is going to be a home run in terms of, you know, you're in your closing argument and constantly quoting things this witness said because they added so much to your case, right? That's that's definitely not always going to happen. But again, you cannot pick witnesses who add nothing to your case. You got to find a happy balance. And uh, this is just a good way to evaluate witnesses. Pick the ones that are going to help your case the most in addition to the witnesses who have a high scoring potential. All right, before we get into the third prong that your witnesses need to meet, I want to remind you about my book, Mock Trial Masterclass, which is full of information that will guide you throughout your entire mock trial season from the point that you're picking witnesses and developing your case theory all the way to competition day with objections and speeches and direct examinations and cross-examinations. It's the ultimate starter guide for mock trial if you're just new to this or if you're looking to sharpen your skills and develop later in your career. There's plenty of tips in here that will help you as well. And if you want to pick up a copy, you can click the link in the description on YouTube or in the show notes if you're listening on podcast platforms. All right, the third way to vet your witnesses is you need to pick witnesses that help you more than they help your opponent. Now, you never want to completely eliminate a witness just because, oh, they they make this good point for my opponent and I don't want them to have that, right? Because again, we're looking for high scoring potential, number one, and number two, we're looking for witnesses that are going to help your case. But if on balance, a witness is going to help your opponent more than they're going to help you, you might want to reconsider calling them. Let me give you a few examples. I can think back to, uh, I believe it was my junior year of college when I was competing at Belmont, and there was an expert witness in the college case that year who was quite frankly awful. I crossed that witness on the other side of the case, and it was one of the easiest crosses I ever did as a mock trial competitor because this witness had so many terrible facts against them. And again, in those rounds, it was a field day for me. So as our team at Belmont, we decided we weren't going to call that expert witness. And the reason we decided that and the reason it was the right decision was, number one, we recognized that because of the natural strength of the cross-examination of this witness, because there were so many bad points against them, it was going to help our opponent more than it was going to help us. Additionally, we recognized that other witnesses had just as high of a scoring potential and other witnesses could make a strong impact on our case. So that was the right decision to leave off that expert part. Another example much more recent in the uh, the Tennessee case this year that I just got done coaching uh, with the high school team that I coach now, uh, there was a police officer in the case. And if this police officer was called, you could prove through this officer's witness statement and through some exhibits related to them, that in this crime that allegedly occurred, the victim of this crime waited three hours in his or her house with a dead body that was shot and dead sitting there. Now, if you're the defense in a case like that, you love that fact because it casts so much doubt on the prosecution's story, right? Why on earth was this victim sitting there for three hours with a dead body in their living room? That makes no sense at all. Well, if you didn't call this witness, that fact got thrown out because this witness was the only one that that fact could come in through. So after looking at it and realizing that this witness would help the other team more than it helped us, and that other options would give us just as high of a scoring potential and that other options could also make a strong impact on our case, we decided not to call that witness. And you know what? It was absolutely the right decision because we ran into multiple teams who really had no idea how to handle uh, the fact that they couldn't get that information in. And you know, it was a big part of their theme, it was a big part of their theory, but they couldn't get it in. And so we wound up messing with other teams basically by not calling their witness. So I hope that through talking through uh, this third prong really helps shed light on how all three work together. Because again, you're not always going to have all three coming together, at least in a significant way. So you just got to do the best you can. But, you know, to the extent that you're able to, you want to call witnesses that are going to have a high scoring potential. You want to call witnesses that are going to make a strong impact on your case. And you want to call witnesses that are going to help you more than they help your opponent. Using that framework will almost every time ensure that you make the right choices and which witnesses to call.